Darren, I remember about three years ago, I think, yeah, it was three years ago, Lauren Julian called me from Millbrook. Yeah. And um, he said, I know this artist, Darren Julian. I said, is he a relative? I said, no, no, different spelling, E and A, I didn't know then. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was my son, Lucas and I, who came to your place the first time. And you had this beautiful painting there. Yeah. And um, it, it, it depicted the tree that was on one side dead. That's where the skyscrapers were, the civilization, so to speak, modern civilization. And on the left side, there were the teepees, and everything was alive on that side of the tree. There, there, there were the eagles or seagulls there. Everything was, was, was really um, completely alive. And to me, it showed so much the connection that First Nations people have to nature. Often was taken away, but at least they did have it, and they're trying to regain it. Mm -hmm. And yet it showed very much how um, people just construct houses, sometimes regardless of where not, uh, you know, looking at the environment, at the wildlife and whatnot. And so the painting I've shown to hundreds of Europeans, I mean, like you've been here many times, but Europeans are here, and they loved it. Mm. And afterwards, if you feel like it, maybe we can go over the painting in English a bit for our viewers, viewers, you know, um, what it's all about. But um, the, se the second thing that was very interesting, suddenly, right, I saw a drum. Um, I saw a drum that was in your shop and I think Mandy, your wife, made it, right? Yep. So I asked you about Mandy and you said, well, she doesn't really paint, but she makes drums. But I was so intrigued by the drum that I was hoping Mandy would paint. And this is three years ago. Yep. Lo looking back, she has a natural ability, a gene or something for it, I'm not sure what it is, but she is an incredibly good artist, painting. And then um, suddenly this nice older lady knocked on our door and she said, I'm Sandra Simon, and I said, nice to meet you. And she said, you know, Darren is my son. And I drew quill baskets. I didn't know what they were at the time. I mean, I had a rough idea and she explained mm. it to me. And by now, I think we must have bought 40, 50 of our quill baskets and they're all through the world on, on display. But my question to you is, obviously your family is full of art and spirituality. Where does it come from? I don't know, I guess. Just the way we're raised and stuff. Like my dad was an artist and I never really knew him, but it's always, we always had his paints and stuff in, these, in our house. And we grew up very traditional and stuff. Right. Yeah. That was you and two brothers, was there? Uh, there uh, Three, three brothers and a sister. Okay. Yeah. Because I know one of your brothers. Yes. So, so your dad did some painting, and you just got into it, and you looked at the paintings that he had done, or how did that work? Well, yeah, like I just seen these paintings. They used to be hanging up on the wall, and I was just sitting there, and I used to draw for the longest time. I don't know until I was probably about sixteen. Then they, my mom decided to get me some paint and try that, and. That didn't work out too good. That, so I used to just paint as a hobby. Yes. And just just go from there. But it did work out really well eventually. Yeah. Uh, so like, how did this come? You really had no education of any kind. This was just... A trial and error. Trial and error. Oh, yeah, I used to paint it, didn't like it, not wipe it down, paint it over, do that. And some of my older paintings, you'll look on the side of them, you'll see like seven different colors. That's how many times I painted that canvas. Yes. Yeah. But you kept on trying. And the yeah. thing is, I can only speak for the last few years. That's since we bought a lot of your artwork. Mm -hmm. But you really have evolved into Roger McDonald said the other day, our former premier, a world class artist. Your paintings are very spiritual, mm -hmm. they um, have a lot of meaning. The style is being perfected constantly. Now you also paint all of chiefs, but sometimes you also paint paint in one in one figure or like one shape, you paint six or seven animals and a person at the same time. Yeah. It's amazing. Like where do these ideas come from? Uh, actually when I first started doing that and putting other things in, I had no idea what I was doing. I just sit there and I'll just paint and probably about thirty percent into it I look at it, step back, I'll try to figure out what it looks like, then I'll paint that. And it's like, what does this look like on that side? And I'll start painting that there, and they just start to form like that there. 
people used to ask me, what are you painting? And I'd be starting off and be like, I don't know. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So really the painting evolves, it comes out of your mind, out of your head. Yeah, I just start with a little brush and just paint. And when I started, it, I don't know what I'm painting. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then of course, when the paintings arrive here, they are always very detailed and then they have a lot of meaning. So mm -hmm. why you paint, I guess the purpose of the painting also evolves, like, like why you do it. Mm -hmm. Or why do I paint it? No, like why you do certain things, like you start with something that could potentially become an eagle, but suddenly the eagle also becomes maybe a fish. So, so really, it's very interesting, really the, the, the purpose of the painting evolves, or the message in the painting evolves also as you paint. I, I don't know because sometimes I painted it and I look at it and I started off as a wolf and it doesn't end up a wolf, it turns into an eagle or turns into a bear or something. Exactly, but how you do it is so amazing. I don't know, it's just, I just comes, I don't plan on it, I don't sit there and think about it or whatever, but some of them I draw it out and I know where everything's planned and it's going to be, but the ones that don't draw out and I just do freehand, I just... Okay. I have no idea where it's going. So you have two ways of painting. One way you do a sketch before and then the sketch kind of tells you where you're going. Yeah. The other one is almost like a happening. You just let it happen and see what, what comes out of yeah. it. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, I can see that your paintings. We probably have 200 of your paintings here and I know them well. Um, yeah, I, I, can certainly, like, I can certainly see that. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm always so, I'm always thinking for me, it's always like Christmas. You come in once a month mm -hmm. and your wife does your mom, you bring your artwork and I'm always so curious and excited. So is all of our staff, what happens, what it looks like. And um, I hope you're gonna keep on painting for a long time because mm -hmm. not only are you in our first book, you'll be in the second Fancy United book too, of course. And um, the, the work is really amazing. Like I'm seeing a lot of Europeans, will ask questions. You brought one painting in that's called 21 of us and you had on the tree, on trees four faces and so I could count four people and you call it 21 of us. And I'm thinking, okay, so there's four. Where's the other 17? And I'm looking, I'm looking and say, I don't see 21 people. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I'm looking at the roots and so there's a tree, the tree trunks and you go down and then the end you have roots and suddenly when you look really close all these roots are faces, like your ancestors. How did you come up with these ideas? Awesome. That's one there that just came to me. I just started painting it and I had no idea what it was at first. Wow. That was all freehand there and I just went with it and it, that's the way it came out. So it's almost like you paint your soul, if you want to call it, that you just paint, paint. I just let the brush go and just do what I want. Turn on the music, listen to music and just sit there and paint. That's something, all the artists I talk to, they like to listen to music while they paint. Yeah. Does it help you? Yeah. It does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know, you kind of lose time, you'd be sitting there you'd look and it'd be like 12 o'clock or something, be painting, and next you know it's like seven o'clock in the evening or something. Right, so really you paint seven hours, but you really don't notice how time passes by. Yeah. Amazing. J. B. Redbird told me the same thing. He says when he paints, he never keeps track of time. Mm -hmm. So you might start early in the morning, done late at night. You might stop for a small snack and that's it. It's almost like he pours his soul into those paintings as, mm -hmm. as you do. So when Mandy paints your wife, um, how does Mandy paint? She, has she paints style. at night. She paints at night. She paints at night. She usually starts maybe about 12 or something, maybe about 11. Then she'll paint until like 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so how do her paintings evolve? I see, like, like I see her say, make some sketches, but does she also have these two things where things evolve or? Or she draws, everything's planned out on her. She draws, she gets a canvas. Yes. And she sketches it out on paper first. Yes. She sketches it all out. Then she'll put it on the canvas and she'll draw it out all again on the canvas. And everything's all drawn out. Everything's all on there before she starts painting. So she has a really diff completely different style from yours. Yeah. Like where yours evolves, she knows exactly where she's going. Yeah, all the colors are all picked out, everything's all planned and everything before she starts painting. Okay. Where I just grab the paint and I just... Go, like, start going. I just grab paint and literally pour it on the, yeah, the canvas and, and just start going with it. Amazing. Hmm. 
So Mandy has a very own style, obviously. <laughs> I, I love all of her paintings. One was called Sun Dancer, who was amazing. Um, I see in her paintings also a lot of spirituality, same thing. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that often your paintings and Mandy's too deal with wildlife, um, the sky, mm -hmm. trees. It, it's all nature and it really seems to connect all the artists. Would you say the same thing? Yeah. Well, I find most of the artists are like very spiritual or traditional and stuff like that there. Yes. And like, I used to go to powwows on all when I was younger. We went from Paris, Ontario to Newfoundland going to powwows. Then I went to uh, Sundances and I was in South Dakota. Right. And you see a lot of different stuff out there and stuff. Well, I've done one painting that's or it's all the Sundancers. Yes. That painting only took five hours to do. Okay. The one with all the sun dancers yes. in the tree and everything. Yes, 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 yes. I started at 12 at night and I finished at 5 in the morning. Okay. I had no idea what I started painting, then that's what came out. Okay. It's just, you paint what you see and we see a lot of Indians and spiritual and stuff like that yes. there. Talk about South Dakota, your mom told me something interesting. Um, I won't stand on it like your mom for three years and she's done many quill baskets for us and she told me that many years ago she had lung cancer. And there's, a, um, I guess, traditional healer or spiritual person mm -hmm. in your community. And while the doctors really said, look, there's nothing we can do, she went to the healer. But she said the healer also learned things in South Dakota, so you must have traveled quite a bit. Yeah. Well, with my mom, they, the doctors told her she has five years to live. Yes. If she quit smoking, that's the maximum they gave her. And that was probably about 20 years ago. But now she's healed. Yeah. She said she did a lot of sweat lodge with she medicine went man. Sweats in, uh, she went to South Dakota. She done four years dancing up there. Then she, uh, she went sun, on a- Like sun dance? Sun dance, yeah. Then she went on a fast and she had a doctor in sweat. And she had a, a medicine made. Yes. The doc she told me about that. Yeah, she yes. had a doctor's letter out to go for the let her out of the hospital to go for the sweats and stuff like that there. Yes. And he made this, uh, like she couldn't breathe. She used to always have that mask on yes. and yes. always on that mist and stuff. Yes. So he made, uh, or it's a skunk oil. Yes. And she had to breathe that in while she was in the sweat. She told me she had to do a lot of different breathing with all kinds of natural yeah. things. And when he done that there, it it's like it cleared out her lungs. Yes. And she was able to breathe and all that there. And after her doctor and sweats and everything, she went in there and she didn't have to be in the hospital anymore. She didn't have to go on her poppers. And like wow. for the last 10 years, I've never seen her take a popper at all. Ever. Uh, yeah. So this is something I'm starting to explore now more and more coming from Germany. I was brought up with a very high sense of reverence for First Nations people. And mm -hmm. in Germany, we hear about these things. But for me to meet a person, and now a close friend of mine, your mother, who this happened to, is amazing. I mean, like, especially your mother, I know so well that mm -hmm. like, if she says how this happened, and you, all, like, you always also were there, that's amazing. So would you say that this also sometimes is being reflected in your paintings, this type of spirituality, and the old, I don't know, remedies you want to call it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, like Mandy's mom, she knows a lot of, uh, traditional medicines and stuff with uh, flag root and stuff like golden threads and stuff yes, like that there. Yes, yes. She knows a bunch of them. She can name them, them all and how to pick them and stuff like that there. Right. Yeah. So she's pretty good with that uh, traditional medicines and stuff. I think the more we can preserve, the better. Really, mm -hmm. like what I've seen coming from Germany years ago, couldn't see very many First Nations people left on the East Coast. I didn't know why. After many years of research, I found out about Mr. Cornwallis, the founder of Halifax, who unfortunately had a bounty in 1749, I think it was, for, like, for a few years on First Nations heads or scalps. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think on the East Coast especially, there's very little left, and the very little that there is left, I hope we can revive. Art is one thing, um, there should be other things too. And this especially, if we can talk to the old medicine people or First Nations people can educate themselves again. It's most important to preserve your language and, and, and the remedies, everything there is. Yeah, like I don't, I can understand a little bit of Mi'kmaq language. Yes. 
I just understand enough to get by, but I can't speak it or... Yes. Yeah, and like they say, uh, like the Mi'kmaq culture is already so, so lost. Yes. Like with the sweat and stuff, and that's borrowed from out west and brought in. Exactly, because yeah. there was nothing left. There's not, there's not really traditional Mi'kmaq left, really. Not much, yes. Not much, yeah. Well, like out of the baskets and canoes and yes. stuff like that out there, that'd yes. probably be it. Well, but even that's, you know, obviously worth saving. Mm -hmm. I know your mom told me she was one of 12 women who used to know how to make quill baskets. Mm -hmm. The other 11 died. She was the last person remaining. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to Friends United, give her opportunities to teach the young children again, others. And I think that's most important because really that's what we are all about, mm -hmm. maintaining the old habits, the old traditions. And it might take a while yet to go look for more and more people, also older people, but the more we can maintain, the better. And um, I spoke to Paul Martin recently, a former prime minister. There was a meeting in uh, Sydney. He was there for, for, like, for the opening of uh, new courses for school, where they're going to be taught about First Nations art and culture. Mm -hmm. But he was really saying two things. First of all, First Nations people should, again, be taught about their own culture more. And again, he also thinks we have to revive that. But number two, I think we also talked about the fact that even other Canadians should also know more about it because it's worth saving. And the way we're trying to preserve the Gaelic language around here, which is very important, Rodney McDonald, who's a big part of our project, our former mm -hmm. premier, is right now the head of the Gaelic College. But he also sees very much the wisdom in preserving First Nations art and culture. And um, how would you go about it? Is there anything else that you, like, that you can think of? Who else can we talk to? Well, the schools are already doing a better job. Like when I was going to school, yes. they had a Mi'kmaq studies class, eh? yes. and we had a choice to take that or French. Yes. So all the Indians or Mi'kmaqs took Mi'kmaq studies. Right. But when we're going to school, that Mi'kmaq studies class wasn't really much. Okay. They had a book there that nobody really understood and stuff like that there. They right. didn't teach us anything about the language or anything like that there. And they had a non-native come in and he was trying to teach Mi'kmaq studies, which he had no knowledge of. Okay, that's yeah. interesting, yes. But now they have uh, native teachers coming in, teaching Mi'kmaq studies, teaching the languages in schools and stuff like that there. And it's not, it's not just open for uh, natives, it's open for everybody in the schools. Yeah, so yes, they're well, already doing a better job in school. I would love to learn some Mi'kmaq too, because, well, coming from Germany again, I was brought up with a very high sense of reverence for First Nations people. Everybody in Europe, actually, that I know mm -hmm. is. And um, Rodney McDonald said something a while ago. I think he said, a culture without a language is almost a dead culture. So the last, last that we have should really be preserved. And the language is certainly a very important part of that, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Here's another question for you, come to think of it. You've been part of our initiative now for three years. Yeah. Your mom too and Mandy too, so there's three artists in the family. Where would you like to go with the initiative, but also where would you like to be as an artist or with your family in two, three, four, five years? Well, right now, just like this week or last week, we got our, me and Mandy, we're opening up our own gallery. Good, yeah. great. We got our own building and stuff, and we took out the smokes out of the smoke shop and we put them in the craft shop, and we got that building for ourselves now. Awesome, this is great. Yeah, so we're gonna set up our print and some uh, canvases and yes. some paintings up there. So then you don't have to have the gift of so much and the smoke shop, but you can also start by selling your own art in your yeah. own small gallery. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is awesome. So like other prints helping that we are providing? Yeah, prints, yeah. Uh, I do pretty good, I probably do, in some months I can do like five a month. Yes. Especially in the summertime. You sell them for fifty or hundred? How much? A hundred, hundred dollars each. So that's yeah. three, four, five hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Good. See, that's the point. This is really what French United is all about. I'm hoping that we can have all the other artists doing the same thing, mm -hmm. because selling paintings is one thing. But as you said before, once once the paintings are sold, they're gone. And so I'm hoping if we can provide prints for you guys mm -hmm. and you hand sign them, then that you can have more of an audience out there and like more people can see what it's all about, it also creates more revenue for you. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, like when, uh, before I make a painting, yes. I make it and somebody else wants it. Yes. And this person likes it and this person likes it or whatever. And right. then uh, they want me to paint the same thing over and over. Which is difficult. Yeah, and 
doesn't matter how hard you try, you cannot do the same painting <laughs> over and over. Thank God, thank God, they're all unique pieces, that's right. Yeah, like the first time I done that half dead tree was on an eight by 10. Oh, you've done it several times. Okay. Yeah, it was on an eight by 10. Oh. I liked it, it was right small. It was half on dead tree, that's the first one I ever bought. Yes. Yeah, it was a small one. And somebody came in and seen it there and he said, that looks nice. He told me how much, I'm like, I don't know. It's a 50, so I sold it to him. I was like all excited, and Mandy said, that was a nice paint, and you should do a bigger one. So I done a bigger one. Right. This was probably about a 20 by a 30. Yes. And somebody was coming in, and they offered me 100, and said, you know, I was quick to sell it there, so Mandy said, you should do a bigger one. He said, everybody loves this, your paint, do a bigger one. Yes. And I done that real big one, which one that you end up buying. For $600, I think it was. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Good. In fact, that's the first piece we ever bought, and mm -hmm. it's on the wall over there. Everybody coming into the center uh, is looking at it, and they're very amazed. So, like, one was a yellow background, right. another one was a real orange background, and this one was like a dark red to a yellow background, yes. the one that you bought. But really, they all carry the same message that yeah. the tree is dead on one side, mm -hmm. where the civilization killed everything off. But on the left side, where the native people are living in tune with nature and harmony, everything's still alive. So I think even though they were different in size, the message was the same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I still had the same, it was the same idea, but it was just different sizes and different colors. Okay. Yeah. So you were saying your father's work inspired you. Did, mm -hmm. did he teach you? No. Okay. No, so I barely knew my father. Okay. Uh, he died in, when I was like 16. Okay, really young. And from when I was younger, like my brothers and sisters, they used to go to go to him when for Christmas and stuff, and like yes. that there. And I always stayed with my mom because yes. I didn't know my father. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But his work inspired you. Yeah. But your mom must have told you quite a bit about him, I would think. Yeah, so, she yeah. told me quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. When I started getting to know him a little later, when I started getting older, yes. that's when. We started getting closer, and that's when he passed away. Sorry, yeah, right. mm. I think always a mother and a father can teach the children. And this goes over a generation, that's how we maintain mm -hmm. things. But really, even though he had died, he could then convey his messages and, 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 and his thoughts with paintings, I mm -hmm. suppose. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I hope you're going to be part of our initiative for a long time. I'm always saying, the people that will ultimately judge the initiative, if anybody ever will or would, are the artists, because this is about the artists, about bringing First Nations people together, about making them cultural ambassadors for Canada, for starters. Mm -hmm. But it's also about eliminating prejudice between First Nations people and other North Americans. And I still see quite a bit of it. Sometimes we even have some staff in Canada, Canadian staff, that really shocked me. What I've seen now, though, the last three years, that people come in here, other Canadians, other North Americans too, and they love the work and they say, wow, First Nations, like First Nation people can do this, we didn't know, or look, if they're given a chance, they can do as much as anybody else. And um, I, I, like we had hired some carpenters from Wake About, they worked also on this building yeah. here. And um, to me, I, I, like, I, like I, I could never understand, people say there's a labor shortage here, well, why don't we hire more First Nations people who work actually quite well for us. Mickey and Mike worked here doing the roof and everything else. Mm -hmm. So I really think after three, four, five hundred years of, I don't want to call it abuse. Yeah, actually it was definitely abuse. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually there are a lot of residential schools, Cornwallis, yes. Can give education to First Nations people. They can do a job like anybody else. And that's my whole point. And you a classic example. So it's your mom. that your mother works so hard. Um, she picks blueberries, she, she, she does look after elderly people, she nurses them, she, she does the quill baskets, she tries so hard to make a living. If everybody had that kind of work ethic, our world would be a much better one. Oh yeah, my mom, she had us working and stuff, when we were young, you know. I was, if I sat down in a blueberry field when yes. I was a kid, they couldn't find me. Yes. That's how young I started working when I was working in a blueberry field and stuff like that there. Right. And I'd be raking now. I used to only rake maybe two boxes, three boxes or something like that there. I was only a kid and I only had a small rake. But each year I came back and she kept on pushing me to rake some more. Okay. So when all these other kids or something, they got their 
a school check, eh? Yes. $110 or stuff like that there for school supplies and whatnot. Yes. And I used to go away for the summer. When I come back, they only made 100 or $110, and I'll come back with maybe 600 700 from raking blueberries and stuff. But you worked for it. I worked for it, yeah. See, so there's my point. First Nations people have often very good work ethics, and they have to often be taught by their parents. If your mother's such a spiritual <coughs> hard worker, who consistently works and works and provides for a family. I think that's important. But obviously, there's a classic example of first age people haul their weight like anybody else, if not even more. Mm -hmm. And I wish more parents would teach their children like that. Because also, these were the work ethics from your mom and the art, and your father then gave you some of, of his artwork or through his paintings. Mm -hmm. and this is how you evolved into who you are. And I think you can be very proud of yourself, but also of your family because what you guys have done um, with the Friends United Project and even long time before on your own is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud that you guys can do that. So this is awesome, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, um, we're going to check out some cool baskets afterwards that your mm -hmm. mom has done, but mm -hmm. I want to thank you for being part of the initiative. I want to thank you for being my friend. And um, I've learned a lot from you over the last three years. Mm -hmm. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm.